10 p.m. in the studios of UBC TV. Hello there and welcome to our second and final uh, edition of News Tonight uh, here on UBC TV uh, this Tuesday, the 7th day of March 2023. First of all, let's have a look at what's making headlines at this hour. In our news tonight, President Museveni meets women leaders ahead of International Women's Day celebrations. Debate on NSSF report ends prematurely as members of parliament cite corruption. A section of legislators wants to reintroduce the GMO bill alongside NGOs. And in sports, city oilers prepare for upcoming Basketball Africa League due in Egypt. Hello there and welcome once again. We are coming to you live online and on air from Broadcast House here on Nile Avenue. My name is Rukidi Edward Kijanangoma. Now President Yuri Kogutam Seveni has met with the Executive Council of the National Women's League at State House in Tebe this evening ahead of the International Women's Day to be celebrated in Sunga, Chiruhura District tomorrow. The team, led by the Minister for Gender, Labour and Social Development, uh, Honourable Betty Amongi, and the chairperson of the Women's League, uh, Hajat Farida Kiboa, presented to the President their performance report and discussed ways to broaden involvement of women, youth and persons with disabilities in mobilisation for wealth creation. Meanwhile, President Yuri Kogutam Seveni has eulogized the late John Najenda as a man who loved his country and an intellectual. The President's condolence message was delivered by the Prime Minister Robina Nabanja at the send-off of Musei John Nagenda at Wotan Simbi village, Buloba in Wakiso district this evening. In his message, President Museveni described the late John Nagenda and as a not only uh, a good writer, but also a patriotic intellectual who used his influence and knowledge of society to inform and educate the public through his skillful writing. Meanwhile, the Kabaka of Buganda, Ronald Mwenda Mutebi II, in his message delivered uh, by Prince uh, Daudi Kintu Wasajja, uh, said that Nagenda has been loyal and good servant to Buganda and will be missed greatly. And Africa. Many people get so much attached to their cultural institutions and forget national unity. Muzai Nagenda was not like that type as he stood for a united Uganda, which made him a true Ugandan. On the Yakotisa, I'm against gay or Mali Ovumu, no kwe wa yo, naturi mo wanga anguse, e wongereza, natura anidira, natura anarutaro, roku zao wa kabaka, nefuga, e goberida amateka mohugan u Uganda. I'm so grateful to have this man as my father. I am honored to have John Robin Mwesigwa Nagata as my dad. The love he had for his country goes beyond unity. The way he always told us the truth. And he said, he told us that he wrote of course what he believed was the truth. And of course he could, as it has been said here, be, uh, he could criticize certain people uh, at certain times. <laughs> And may the late Najinda soul rest in eternal bliss. To the August House, where Parliament has cited corruption in the management of the National Social Security Fund, 
as the MPs debate the report of the Select Committee on the State of Affairs at NSSF, the recommendations have largely been welcomed. Uh, the MPs hoped to adopt the report with few deliberations on amendments. However, the Minister for Gender, Labor and Social Development, uh, Betty Amongi, will have to first respond to the allegations against her. Parliament will wait until Thursday, March the 9th, for Minister Betty Amongi. The Tuesday afternoon session chaired by Speaker Anita Among, Minister of Finance Planning and Economic Development, was the first to respond agreeing with faulting the agreements between NSSF and various entities which were outside the authorization of the Attorney General and the need to streamline the dual supervision of the fund. This could call for an amendment of the NSSF Act. I, I agree that the full supervision of the fund should be streamlined back to the Ministry of Finance planning and economic development as was re recommended by His Excellency the President during the amendments of the NSSF Act. The Minister for Finance in his response read by Minister Evelyn Anite reiterates that the controversial 6 billion request by Minister Betty Amongi was irregular. For the 10 years that NSSF was directly supervised by the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development, this scenario did not occur. It was not, it will not occur even when this is returned to the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development. A stalemate first ensued after some members of Parliament who were part of the board members of NSSF mentioned in the report to have illegally received 10% NSSF contributions decried an oversight for not being heard by the select committee. The right to be heard means that a person must appear before an impartial tribunal, in this case the committee before it proceeds to render an adverse recommendation like it did. The accused MPs include Magola Steven, Werike Peter Christopher and Agnes Kunhira who are part of the NSSF board members. The chair has a lot of time, he should allow us to talk because he did not give us the time at the floor, at the committee level. But Agnes, Agnes, but did you go to the committee as a, a workers representative? They called me for another issue. They never asked any question. He's here. If he asked me anything to do with that matter. You ought, and this should go to all of us, the committee chairpersons, that every time you're going to make a recommendation and it's going to affect, I mean affect an individual, you must give that individual an opportunity to be heard. We shall debate, look at the, all these issues, and what will happen, the matter goes to court and the, the recommendations are quashed and would have wasted a lot of our time. The Speaker of Parliament found no room for stopping further debate. Some members wanted the matter to be expunged from the report and a fair hearing is first given to the accused members. We must do all it takes to preserve this uh, report. Can, can I plead, Right Honourable, that we stand over the debate on yeah. only this part. We are not standing over any debate. Uh, uh, have you heard? I have heard, right, Honorable. Uh, on, <laughs> a decision was not taken by them to pay them. We must hold the persons who paid them culpable. If the person who paid them wants to recover from them, then he should recover from them. The MPs condemn corruption that is eating up the fund. And this is people's money. Somebody who has his money to go there and begin playing around with people's money. We cannot entertain, as the senior is saying. In fact, my first prayer, right honorable speaker, I wish somebody could take this message to the president. There is no way a better investigation will go on when the minister concerned is still the minister overseeing the program. Let the minister, let the president do justice to this country ask the minister to, say, to step aside as investigations continue. The Minister for Gender, Labor and Social Development, Betty Amongi, whom the report recommends immediate resignation, was not in the House, forcing the debate to end prematurely. I'm not one of those who want to hang Minister Amongi. Although she tried all her level best to access six billion outside the requirements, she did not succeed. There is nowhere in the report which mentions that 
Minister of Gender got the six billion money. Daniel Mugoya, Gloria Gwitabinji, UBC News. Now to matters pertaining to the judiciary and to extend justice to all Ugandans, the judiciary has come up with various mechanisms, among others, open court days, talk shows and mobile van barazas to create public awareness on judicial services. Speaking at the judiciary headquarters in Kampala, the chief registrar, Sarah Lang Siu, highlighted on procedures detailing how criminal matters will be handled from the complaint stage to the sentencing, especially in magistrate courts. We have more in this story. 66,494 pending criminal matters in the courts of judicature in Uganda. 49,077 cases are lagged in the magistrate's courts, brought about by various factors. Uh, in terms of total case load in the judiciary, stood at 167,629. Those were our pending cases. So this accounts to close to 40% of our current workload are criminal matters. Uh, we are making strides in, in reducing case backlog, but we are not yet there. The reason we are not there is uh, there are many factors. One of some are within our control, some are outside our control. This has prompted the chief register Sal Langasiu to highlight on the process detailing on how criminal matters in the magistrate courts are handled. Victim of a wrong, reporting the matter to police. Police opens up a general inquiry file and then we have police doing further investigations, many times by way of taking out statements. So once the police has managed to do all these statements, they has put them together, it will reduce the findings from those statements into a charge sheet. The charge sheet will be indicating the, the age, for example, of the accused, and why is this important? Because we must distinguish juveniles from adults. So it is important that these particulars are all indicated in this charge sheet. In her submission, Langa says charges are read to an accused person in a language well deserved by the accused person, which necessitates for him or her to take plea, which plea determines whether it's a persecution case or not. We will notice that most of our criminal cases are usually titled Uganda. Why? Because these cases are filed in the name of the state. The court does not force anyone to, to go by a certain language. You will find someone saying, I'm an engineer, but I'm comfortable in Luganda. It is that person's right to have the charges read to them in the language that they are very comfortable with and they understand. However, Langa also observed that there are situations where the accused persons will have to defend himself, and this will lead to filing of written submissions which will form the grounds for the judges to premise their judgments. We are assessing the evidence of the prosecution at this stage and it will be able to establish whether that evidence is sufficient to warrant putting an accused person to their defense. So the full case has been heard. If submissions were required, the same have been already filed. The court now proceeds to write a judgment. The criminal trial proceeding in the magistrate courts is provided by the law. Rebecca Natongo, Susan Nabugode, you. Now, a bill to prohibit genetically modified organisms is underway to Parliament for the second time, led by former ethics minister and Bufumbira County Member of Parliament and Sabab Turo. The legislators claim genetically modified organisms are a danger to African indigenous crops and life. A section of the lawmakers announced the move to reintroduce the bill alongside some non-governmental organizations at Parliament uh, this Tuesday. Genetically modified organisms are simply known as GMOs, are plants or animals whose DNA has been altered in laboratories using genetic engineering instead of breeding. Risks associated with the GMO, according to the legislators, include but not limited to GMO seeds are terminator crops. This means it can only be planted once. It has health-associated risks and GMO crops can infect indigenous crops through pollination. That is one of the primary objectives, causing the extinction of traditional seeds, traditional crops. And if that happens, 
it is very easily now places our people in a position of dependence. In other words, for millions and millions of years, our people have fed themselves, they have depended on their seed to continue planting every season, but the, the importance of GMO is to put a stop to that sovereign. With the negative impacts of the new technology, the lawmakers say if not careful, GMO is a modern slavery the West is using to destroy Africa's indigenous crops. The problem is that Africa is very beautiful and Uganda is even the most beautiful. At some time you must all be finished. You must die and they occupy Uganda. And every method including GMOs must be applied on you if you are not careful. Since GMOs also have risks associated with health, the MPs also say it might be used as a tool to destroy Africa's population. We also want to put it clear that 97% of the genetically modified organisms are crops that generate novel toxins or they have a process that they call biochemical accumulation. They accumulate the pesticides that are spread on them. And once these, uh, these crops release these items, they are bound to pollute air, they are bound to, to pollute water, and also bound to pollute food. Now, as an environmentalist, I am against all kinds of pollution. The lawmakers announced the move to reintroduce the bill alongside some non-government organizations at Parliament this Tuesday who also pledged to support Parliament in the war against GMOs. We can't condone initiatives of the world to try to erode and extinct our culture. As Ugandans, we have very rich culture in food. Right now, we are yet food sovereign. Where are we sovereign? We have our indigenous um, crops here, seeds are here, which we still have them. But there's this initiative of introducing GMO coming in slowly to rob us of this sovereignty. Now we are part of the team uh, supporting the, the private members bill. Uh, prohibiting GMOs in this country. As a small-scale farmers uh, movement, uh, we've managed over time to make sure that we create uh, an environment that proves uh, the promoters of GMOs wrong uh, in trying to do participatory uh, plant uh, uh, breeding in farmer field schools. The exact day when the bill is going to be at Parliament is not yet set, but it should be noted that this is going to be the second time that the bill will be at Parliament. The first one was rejected by President Museveni on grounds of who is to be responsible when a gym or garden infects a non gym or garden through pollination. Philip Aguta for UBC News at Parliament. Kampala Capital City Authority technical team has been tasked to present a complete contract agreement for the purchase of seven ambulances and five motorcycles following their failure to give accountability of 3.7 billion shillings cited in the Auditor General's report 2022 to have been spent. The chairperson of the Parliamentary Committee on Statutory Authorities and State Enterprises, Joel Senyonyi, said the half-baked information KCCA officials presented in an extract document from the agreement lacks the quantities of what was uh, procured. Farida Nafka reports. And we excuse KCCA uh, out. They can sit somewhere within the, the building. And we have an in-house. Members of parliament on the Committee of Statutory Authorities and State Enterprises spent the entire morning and afternoon querying the purchase of ambulances and motorcycles at 3.7 billion shillings by Kampala Capital City Authority in the financial year 2021-2022. Kampala Capital City Authority presented a document to the committee that indicates the ambulances were purchased at 1.6 billion, not 3.7 billion, as it is stated in the report of the Auditor General 
and the motorcycles at 52 million shillings. The money in question was allocated by government for COVID-19 response but was diverted. However, the MPs cross-examined KCC officials on how they executed a contract without the quantity of the yeah, items. Of 1.6. So here you can see we are going back in the chicken and egg business because these two did not meet through concern. Of this, it doesn't even show that they are part of the contract. Actually, it shows that this is the only part of the contract. Through his agent around here, be directed to produce those files which were left behind, together with the logbooks of the ambulances. The director, public health, Daniel Okello, and the director, legal, Caleb Mogisha, told the committee that the document they presented was an extract from the whole contract agreement in an attempt to respond to queries raised by the auditor general. The question. Mm -hmm. My understanding is so actually most of these documents are standard documents, standard forms that are generated by PPDA. What we do is input information and make sure that the information we input is in accordance with. The chairperson of the committee, Joel Senyonyi, said KCCA's figures on the purchase of the ambulances in the document they presented was 1.6 billion, different from their financial statement, which is 2.3 billion, and that from the Auditor General, which reflected 3.7 billion shillings. Now that people say you just skipped to bring these particular documents because we want that, that entire file, as far as I'm concerned, you people are failing to account for this money. Chisaka expressed disappointment with the Office of the Auditor General accusing it to have altered the figures presented to them in the exit meeting detailing the harmonized areas earlier cited in the preliminary audit report. The accounting officer that I can do is show you my documentation that accounts all that shows what I spent. But I cannot speak into the figures that the, the Auditor General has added on because I really cannot defend them. So what was there reconciliation? Not that I know of. Eh? The reconciliation that has been made as a result of the discussion here uh, indicated that the figure that was included of 700,000, which was for a different item. So the figure there is 1.3 billion for the 39 office years. The Auditor General also raised a query on management of public land, citing the land on Plot 17 Krumah Road, which was acquired fraudulently by the current occupants, yet it used to house a government health centre. If we were to actually go to court, we would be saddling government with unnecessary costs in damages, and I do not want to be that person who starts pursuing court matters that will actually not gain anything. I am yet to be given instructions on how to actually handle this matter. I cannot instruct myself. The committee has resolved to summon people who were on council during that time and those from the Uganda Land Commission like Ruth Chijambu to appear on Thursday and give information in regards to this land. I'm Nafka Farida and Dan Logemo in Kampala. Now, the Minister for Education and Sports, Janet Kataham Seveni, has commended Pastor Jackson Senyonga for his contribution towards the education sector in the country. This has been disclosed in her message read by the Director, NRM Mobilization, uh, Rosemary Seni, at commissioning the main hall of Code High School in Mukono. Let's get the detailed report. <laughs> The Minister for Education and Sports, Janet Museveni, has promised to support educationists in transforming the livelihoods of the young generation. This was contained in a message delivered by the Director NRM Mobilization, Rosemary Seninde, while commissioning the main hall of Code High School, Mokono. Uh, in her message to the young people, she has encouraged the young people to keep themselves uh, safe and uh, most of all to keep themselves pure and to try and, and, and accomplish their studies because we have seen many of our children have gone to, through uh, early marriages and uh, early sex 
and many of them have had early pregnancies which have actually affected their development, uh, particularly their hopes for the future. Mama has started a campaign, a serious campaign, in all schools, and this campaign has started in the started in Soga sub-region. She's going to take it throughout the country, campaigning for children to be safe, which is called the WAIT campaign. Rosemary Seninda encouraged students to desist from all forms of immorality. So that by the time they complete their studies, at least they are pure. And that is a good call upon our young people. And of course, uh, this will help them probably to prevent themselves from early marriages and early sex and fight those vices. So I think if we do that, we shall be able to protect the children of this country. Of course, we want to thank, the. she has also thanked Pastor Senyong and his wife for this development because we've seen many people who get money and who are rich and at the end of the day they either build hotels, they build shops and uh, other, facil other things uh, other than education. Pastor Jackson Senyonga, the proprietor of Cod High School, said the main hall will be used to train students in the proposed new curriculum. And you cannot go to Cod High School and lose. You are here to win and you can to win in Jesus name. Because we don't do this because we have to do it. We do it because we believe there is a call and uh, there, is a, there is a mandate from God that is given to us to be a part of a generation. So you are the presence of tomorrow, students, and you are going to be the leaders of our next generation. Relatedly, students and teachers of Code High School Mukono have celebrated the passing of their Uganda Advanced Certificate of Education for the year 2022, Sudat Kaye, UBC News. St. Teresa Gayaza Girls Primary School is buzzing ahead of centennial celebrations uh, this weekend. For any education institution in Uganda to celebrate 100 years of existence is testimony of hard work and perseverance amid its tough economic and political times. Uh, in fact, it's God is mercy because this, the, the school started long ago with um, something like 25 girls, but now we have something like over 1,000 children. So I may say that it is God is mercy, God is providence. That's why we have managed to, to move all this far. But this is the elite class and honor that St. Teresa Girls Primary School in Gayaza will join this weekend. Uh, we have a big number of children, but uh, the classrooms are not enough because the number is big. But again, we want to thank the government of Uganda and the district of Wakiso because they have been assisting us, giving us uh, classrooms, desks, but still, because of the big number, we still need more classrooms. From a very humble beginning, St. Teresa Girls Primary School has witnessed transformations that were enabled through dedication and sacrifice. They started this school in order to educate the girl child, to uplift the standards of the girl child. And the school has grown up to now to mark 100 years, and we are proud of it. Now it has become a mixed school, which is educating both genders. The celebrations on the theme of celebrating 100 years in service and raising a holistic child have started with a corporate social responsibility activity of cleaning the Gaza neighborhood. Today, as we prepare to celebrate 100 years of the of St. St. Teresa Primary School, our community is going to engage in the cleaning of the area such that we show people the goodness of cleanliness. Set to a sport to the wrong person. Here's how to reverse it with MTN Mobile Money. Dial star 165 hash. Select My Account. Select Initiate Reversal. You will see your last three transactions. Select the transaction you want to reverse. Enter your Mobile Money PIN and you'll get an SMS confirmation that the transaction has been blocked from being withdrawn. And that's it. Please note, 
any transactions that haven't been withdrawn can be reversed. Research and Development Center. Good handicap Friday and Gabi Munya. Maka San and Gabi Mukaga match. Go be Bimavi was a preserve of Bidas of Maja. But you know, go sit in a good time as a car. No, Mutuaro. Over the training, eh? Jango. Or you go Kwanga Kuma Kungu and the centers of Namu Yanja. Or you give about Rusa, Endisa, Nakura Yanja. And what day? There's a Janja Bayavio. A Ruby Kumotia. Gabira Martin of Yamotindo. Oh, more as more. Put it over Yanja. Bouncing Kazo Zavana. Every Sandy Santo Co. And Doko Kasiku. But you're a Guru. Okuva by Yuga Venja. The organizing committee of North Chigezi Diocese is delighted to inform the public of the consecration and enthronement service of Reverend Onesimus Asimwe as the 6th Bishop of North Chigezi Diocese on Sunday, 12th of March, 2023 at Emmanuel Cathedral, Chinyasano, Rukunjiri at 9 a.m. The chief guest is His Excellency General Yori Kaguta Museveni, the President of the Republic of Uganda. RSVP Honorable Major General Jim Muhwezi, Minister of Security and Chairperson Consecration and enthronement. Get the most affordable 4G smartphone in Uganda from Airtel. Now heavily discounted from 250,000 shillings to 150,000 shillings only. Yes! 150,000 shillings only to keep you connected to your loved ones. Dell Star 175 Star 94 Hash to activate free 1GB instantly and 100% double data on all weekly and monthly battles for three months. Get one today while stock lasts from the nearest Airtel shop with Airtel, the smartphone network. This isn't just a girl. She is the future. This is a teacher, a doctor. A community leader, our future president. <laughs> this is our family's pride. This, this is my friend. This is the future of our nation. She is the future of Uganda, and the policies I enact today will protect her from teenage pregnancy. She is the hope of our community, and I will talk to others about how we must protect her. She is our family's pride, and I will protect her from child marriage and talk to her about the dangers of teenage pregnancy. We each have a role to play in empowering our teenage girls to protect them from child marriage and pregnancy because when we empower them, we empower our nation. Protect the girl, save the nation. Their support meant so much to me. I stayed focused and was protected from child marriage and teenage pregnancy. I will support other girls against child marriage and teenage pregnancy. Take action. Report any case of defilement or child marriage to the police or call Sawuti 116. The Uganda Water and Environment Week is back. Join us as we deliver value internally and externally by promoting a multinational integrated approach that links all sectors of water and environment and also explore and deliberate on the water and environment resources to climate resilience. The week commemorates three sector days of World Water Day, World Forestry Day and World Meteorological Day. The Uganda Water and Environment Week will take place from 12th to 17th March 2023 at the Ministry of Water and Environment Headquarters in Luzira under the theme Water and Environment for Climate Resilient Development. Uganda Water and Environment Week is organized by Ministry of Water and Environment through the Water Resources Institute with support from development partners. The 
Right Honorable Dr. Rebecca Alitwala Kadaga, who also doubles as the first Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for East African Community Affairs, congratulates His Excellency General Yoweri Kaguta Museveni, the President of Republic of Uganda and the entire Women Fraternity of Uganda and the East African Community on the commemoration of the International Women's Day under the theme equal opportunities in education, science and technology for innovation and a gender equal future. The ministry pledges to continue serving the country through various initiatives and priority programs that subscribe to Uganda's development plans, Vision 2040, SDGs and the East African Regional Integration Agenda. Bills the old way. Let's go, let's go. Just need to buy some power. Mm. Paying your bills with the My Airtel app. <laughs> Bro, there's a line. You have the power in your pocket. The power to instantly pay your bills hassle free. Unlock that power with the My Airtel app. Visit the App Store or Google Play now. Oh, you're back. Welcome back from that break, and this is our second and final edition of News Tonight here on UBC TV. Moving on, the International Crimes Division Court has set the 17th of April 2023 to proceed with the pre-trial hearing of the case where Omsingo Arwinsururu, Charles Wesley Mumbere, and 200 subjects are accused of offences of treason, murder, terrorism, among others, in Kasese. Now, this follows absence of the accused persons in court who were supposed to appear via Zoom but failed due to the internet interruptions. The International Crimes Division Court in Kololo had indicated 7th March 2023 to proceed with the trial hearing of the cases against Tom Singer for Cassese Charles Wesley Mumbere and his 200 subjects of treason, murder, aggravated robbery, and terrorism, among others which cases prosecution alleges were committed in Kasese district in 2016. However, before Justice Icecom Hanji, this was impossible due to the absence of the accused persons in court who are likely to appear via video conferencing since they are in various prisons across the country. This follows the poor internet connection in the courtroom, which prompted Justice Kom Hanji to attend the matter to the 17th of April 2023. Mumbai and his subjects were arrested in November 2016 from Hikira Royal Palace in Kasese District to answer charges of murder, treason, kidnap, terrorism, aggravated robbery, and malicious damage to government property. In another development, prosecution in the Russia neglect case against events promoter Abe Musenguzi, Alias Abitex, and MC Francis Elvis Joko has asked court for more time since investigations in the matter are still ongoing. Abidex and MC Juko appeared at Machine Chief Magistrate's Court before Magistrate Iga Adiru on bail instructions. Magistrate Adiru adjourned the matter to the 6th of April 2023. The accused persons deny all the 13 counts that DPP preferred against them of Russian neglect causing death to 11 people and Russian neglect causing injuries to two people during the New Year stampede at Freedom City. In Inama Suba Wakiso District, Rebecca Nantongo, Susan Nabugude, UBC News. Now, the border, which is alleged to have been used by the accused in the murder of Maria Najirinya and Ronald Chitaiba, has been presented to court by the 16th prosecution witness. Witness Sam Pija Dennis told court how the accused, Mwonge, came to borrow his border while at Natete, although he did not ask him what he was going to use the border for. The accused persons in the case of Maria Nagrinya, known as Chitaimbwa, include Kasolo Kopriam, Lubega Johnson, Kaliango Nasif, Chiseka Hassan, Mpanga Sharif, and Katerega Sadat, 
Prosecution witness number 16 in the hearing of the matter in the murder of Maria Nagilinya and Donald Chitayimbwa was Sempija Dennis. Sempija alleged to bore a border border number UAJ 395G to a one muonge on 28th August 2019 night at Senegaya stage in Natate. <laughs> Mukuru Kamoga Musa Najimua Najinziza Kumacha Sada Mukumuraba Oruva Nimara Wixibiri Police Yajan Enquata Bansanga Waka. Although he returned to the border border the following day, he did not ask him what he had gone to do with it. The alleged border border was presented to court and the witness same Pija was able to identify the said Mwonge. However, during cross-examination, Sempija failed to defend his statement. He made at police after arrest. We have to go to the police. We have to go to the police. We have to go to the statement. We have to go to the statement. We have to go to the court. We have to go to the statement. We have to go to the police. 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 We have to Yes, or not? Yes, sir. Sempija was also asked to show out the documents showing the ownership of the alleged border border. We now could have gone on the Jamaica, we found some on the pitch, which is Kuna Volu, which are the court. The talk on the Gano, you know, Defense asked court to dismiss Sempija's police statement in court as prosecution exhibit. However, prosecution objected. This honorable court is enjoined to observe the demeanor of the witness was that he appeared to be scrutinizing the same. And in the alternative that this court is inclined not to admit the same that the same be admitted for identification we saw prior. Judge Isaac Mwata set forth in the March 2023 to deliver ruling Deborah Nama Monde, UBC News. Members of Action Coalition for Development and Environment, a code, have today released the post-COVID-19 climatic change friendly study report with a recommendation that government considers allocating more resources to the water and environment sector. Shadow Minister for Water and Environment, also Kiboga Woman Member of Parliament, uh, Christine Nachimoe Rokaya, presided over the function here in Kampala. The Shadow Minister for Water and Environment, also Chiboga Woman MP, Christine Kaya Nachimiro, has challenged government to put in place regulations to operationalize the 2021 Climate Change Act. Najimuiro was presiding over the release of the post-COVID-19 climate change friendly study report conducted by Action Coalition for Development and Environment Accord at Skies Hotel Naguru. 20, in 2021, our Climate Change Act was approved by the President. But to date, two years down the road, we do not have regulations to enforce the implementation of this law. That is a big challenge. And uh, I am calling on civil society organizations, both national and international, to come, to join hands, especially in fundraising. We are very happy and delighted that the Ministry of Water and Environment has established a financing department. The report recommends that government allocate small budgetary resources to the sector as opposed to slashing it as evidenced in the current financial. Reversal in terms of finance, just it is a reversal. And therefore, we recommend actually that Uganda increases financing for environment and natural resources, especially climate change, adaptation, resiliency, that we, we, if we are going to recover the entire economy. Bob Hatif, Assistant Commissioner responsible for climate change issues in the Ministry of Finance, welcomed such interventions which put a check on government. So you can see the big challenge ahead of us. Um, but I think all is not lost. Again, when we have this kind of exchanges in between ourselves, and then we see how these voices can sit through to where these allocations are made. And again, we really very much appreciate it. 
The study was supported by South Africa Institute of International Affairs. Miriam Wumcha and Collins Juko, UBC News. A state minister for relief, for disaster preparedness and refugees, Honorable Esther Anyakun, has met a delegation from Burundi that is in the country to visit the different refugee settlements hosting refugees from Burundi. And their visit comes at a time when the government of Uganda is advocating for voluntary repatriation of refugees to Burundi. Charlotte Muge reports. In 2015, demonstrations broke out in Burundi due to political unrest. This resulted into the fleeing of over 200,000 Burundians to neighboring countries, among them Uganda. As of 2023, Uganda is hosting about 1.5 million refugees and asylum seekers. Of these, 40,852 are Burundians residing in Chaka, Nachivale, Ramwanja, Kampala and other cities within the country. The increasing numbers of refugees in the country has affected the government's ability to provide them with basic needs. Pressure is coming because of the funding. Once you're hosting people and you don't provide them all the services, it becomes an issue. Because if they don't get all the basic needs, all that you expect them to be getting, the schools probably don't have enough space to have the host community for example, and the, and the refugees. The state visit of Burundian officials comes at a time when both governments are advocating for voluntary repatriation of Burundian refugees back to their country of origin, as required under the UNHCR statute on safe repatriation of refugees, to which Uganda and Burundi are signatories. When they come back from, to, to Burundi, uh, the reason why we have come to look for them is because we have a plan how we are going to receive them. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you know, people have social life, they could have got married to Uganda, they could, be, could have started businesses in Uganda, so you, you cannot stop a person and tell them that you go back to Burundi, yet they feel probably they're doing better here. But going back home, they can still have a connection uh, and a cohesion with their families back in, in Burundi, which, is, which we are encouraging. Government of Burundi has come up with incentives to enable the social and economic development of the refugees that return home voluntarily. We know everyone ha had his own personal issues, like if you had left your home and, not, and it was old, like it was destroyed, now we help you to rebuild it so that when you come back you have a shelter in partnership with you and Sierra, we give them some funds. We give them some seeds to go and start farming or digging in their gardens. Uganda signed a tripartite agreement with the government of Burundi and the United Nations High Commission for Refugees to facilitate the repatriation of Burundian refugees. Charlotte Amuge and Dan Logemoa for UBC News. Now, as the world celebrates 46 years of the International Women's Day, ever since the United Nations declared 8th March as an International Women's Day public holiday, Uganda will be celebrating 39 years ever since it domesticated the UN declaration of 8th March as International Women's Day. However, most shocking is that uh, there is uh, less has been done by government and the elite Ugandan women to help rural women understand the day and its significance uh, to women emancipation. In this report, we attempt to establish the disconnect between urban elite women and rural women in Uganda. It's 39 years since Uganda declared the Women's Day public holiday and 46 years since the United Nations declared this day the 8th of March as International Women's Day each year to be celebrated, recognized and remembered by women. However, despite this fact, as Uganda joins the rest of the world to celebrate the International Women's Day in Chiruhura district on Wednesday this week, many women, especially in the rural Uganda, are ignorant about this day. The level of illiteracy about the day is alarming in the districts of Luero, Mitiana, Kasanda, among others. They don't know the role and importance of Women's Day celebrations. Rumani or Naku? Rumani. Eh. Unka di Ramani Rakuchi? Eh. Hm. Cheju. Cheju Torumani. Hm? Gotorumani. Sirumani. Kari Oriwakao. Hm? Oriwakao. Hm. Kari. 
Eh. Do you want to Eh. Hmm. Or you want to go to the market? Do 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 you the Mojo women in those districts, unlike their fellow women, are well informed of the day. However, they urge government to conduct more civic education to enlighten rural women about the day with a lot of mindset change development programs about the importance of Women's Day and the role of women in society. The former woman member of parliament, Sylvia Namabide, the proprietor of St. Elizabeth Girls SSS in Mitiena, commended government for bringing women at the forefront of political governance and charging them with responsibilities in the fight against domestic violence and corruption. Having been the area member of parliament in the ninth parliament, Namabide has no regrets about the 20 years she spent in active politics attempting to build the nation in the health sector. Uh, today, people tell me, oh, a man is Oyoko, uh, uh, and uh, they are picking and getting money. So I, I made a big contribution to poverty, uh, uh, I can't say eradication, uh, but uh, supporting people uh, to fight poverty in the Indian district. Okay. And then when it comes to schools, uh, so I, gave, I, gave, I supported schools. Uh, I supported, uh, I gave up lots of bursaries uh, to girls to come here to St. Elizabeth. To, I think I gave out over 300 bursaries. The woman model farmer in Mawagamitiana district, Beatrice Mbalide, having over 100 acres growing banana plantation, poultry, piglet, goose, cattle, sheep and goat rearing, among others, advises women to establish income generating projects to avoid the dependency syndrome. For example, at least to rear some chicken and uh, you begin with uh, one goat, all right. It, it has to be a humble beginning. You need not to have a lot of things to begin. And uh, very many people, they, they fear to begin, but I encourage most of the women to, to be at least having something. For example, which can help uh, in buying at least an additional thing at home. Never to wait only for our husbands. Uh, fellow Ugandans. Mbalide Beatrice supplies agricultural products to Mitiana Modern SSS and St. Mary's Mukoko High School in Kalugu District and employs over 40 youth on the farm. These women in Luera and Kasanda districts have appealed to government to invest more funds in women groups working in the informal sector. <laughs> Biting the money, the Yamamuki. Empower our girls, since they are women, to be a better tomorrow in this nation. I'm a teacher of history and Sierra E, and also the same as the hostel admin. Kasivante, compile this report. Mm. Uh, very sad indeed that uh, the rural folk, especially the women, do not understand their day even as we prepare to mark it uh, tomorrow. Now let's go to Kasese district, uh, specifically to where uh, where it is. It's also bad news from there, where it is said that uh, Buera General uh, Hospital has most of its medical equipment old and can no longer be used effectively. The increasing number of patients is also stretching and hampering service delivery at the hospital. A state minister for national guidance, uh, Godfrey Kabianga, appreciated the state of the hospital and pledged the government's commitment to support the hospital. Ivan Kahwa reports. Minister of State for National Guidance, Godfrey Kavyanga, has conducted a familiarization tour to Wera General Hospital to assess the current status. The hospital provides services to over 65,000 people from the neighboring districts and as well citizens from the DRC. 
While on a fact-finding mission, it was established that most of the equipment used to offer health services to the population is obsolete and needs replacement. We have now bland equipments. So as a hospital, when we receive funds, we try buying. We always buy. And uh, when you are buying one, one set, and you have around four sections that you, people are supposed to be, to be working, many times you find our doctors scheduling themselves that after the other one has finished, then the other one, has come, the other one come on to, to operate because they have to share the, the equipment we are using. We have not had a, a refurbishment of these other equipments and the mattresses. So the mattresses grow old. As a hospital, we try buying, but because the demand is too high, you can't, you can't have enough mattresses. So most of the patients come with, the, with mattresses and then we place them on, on beds. And where we have, we, we have more patients than the beds, we put them on the floor. But the most important thing is to give them treatment. So I, I think what we can do, we are going to report. And me, what I will take to government is that we need to replace equipment with more than what? Equipment. Uh, they, they, the increase in demand for health services has also outcompeted the medical supplies at the facility and it is run without an ambulance. And you know, the, it, is always, it is always a period of two months. They give us supplies every after, every after two months. So they, they, we run out of those supplies when we still have like, like a month or even three weeks. And uh, what the doctors do? They always refer the patients to go, and buy, to go and buy those supplies from outside. They just write for them the medicine. A government can consider. They can give you more than that using the affirmative action procedure. If you give proper justification, and mainly in terms of number of patients received, the catchment area, and also the health centers surrounding, how many are they, what, what are they doing, and then we make a justification. At the moment, a new structure is under construction. Once completed, the neonatal department, currently housed at different wings of the hospital, will be shifted to it. Basically, we have been handling children, the, the prematures and those who are uh, born while very sick. They were being handled at maternity ward because it is too congested. We separated them and created the wing on uh, pediatric ward, still it became too small. As a hospital, we sat down, the staff. We made a proposal, we wrote to Baylor, and Baylor went to UNICEF. UNICEF sold the proposal to World Bank, and World Bank gave us a grant of around 350 million, which is constructing that new building. And then UNICEF is supposed to equip it to 100%. So we are hopeful by August it will be fully constructed, and we shall be able to uh, transfer the, the new units from pediatric now to a more safer place. The hospital management wants the government to consider giving the hospital a regional status due to the magnitude of patients being handled. You say, look, Minister of Health, because of our population, because of this, our health center threes are not like the health center threes in Karamoja, in Karangara. We need more senior what? nurses. We need more senior doctors. And they will improve the structure of the district so that a doctor shouldn't stagnate in where she, he can even go to another place within the district on what? Promotion. Government has committed to support the hospital to run smoothly using the available resources. Ivan Kahua and Moses Mutabari in Kasese district. Now, uh, the government of Uganda recognizes uh, the increasing burden of diabetes and other non-communicable diseases as a major social economic challenge. Uh, State Minister for Primary Health Care, Margaret Muhanga, in a speech uh, delivered for her by the Director of Public Health, uh, Dr. Daniel Chabainze, uh, says uh, the number of diabetes cases is alarming. Chawaize was addressing health stakeholders at a diabetes spotlight meeting held at Kampala. Globally, an estimated 422 million adults were living with diabetes in 2014. This is projected to reach 700 million by 2045. The total number of people with diabetes in Africa is predicted to increase by 100 
29% to 55 million by 2045. The State Minister for Primary Health Care, Margaret Muhanga, represented by the Director of Public Health, Dr. Daniel Chabainze, says 48 people die every day in Uganda from diabetes. With the coming of the WHO and the World Diabetes Foundation to support our efforts on diabetes, I have no doubt their interventions and support will leave Uganda stronger in terms of diabetes prevention and control systems. The Chairperson Health Committee, Dr. Charles Ayume, says 4.5 billion shillings has been earmarked to procure items for screening and testing of vital health parameters. This will be distributed to the over 3,000 public health facilities countrywide. We stand together in the fight against some of these issues like the NCDs. And uh, advocacy groups in Parliament are quite strong. Sometimes they, they, if you're not careful as a committee, they may stand, they may kind of overtake it because they advocate and they co-opt members from uh, different committees. It's not only from the health space. Like the Acting World Health Organization Uganda Country Office, Dr. Charles Njuguna, committed more support to diabetes and other non-communicable diseases. I want to encourage the people working around diabetes and non-communicable diseases to ensure that we participate more in uh, emergency response. We have established a pillar for essential, for continuity of essential health services. It is during this kind of emergencies that we are able to mobilize a lot of resources. The mission we've had all these many years has been the same. Alleviate human suffering related to diabetes among those in greatest need, meaning we go to countries where the need is, is high and where resources can be scarce. Health stakeholders are calling on for more government funding towards diabetes and other non-communicable diseases. I'm Navka Farida and Ganga Henry. Uh, still on matters pertaining to the health uh, sector, uh, Macquarie University College of Veterinary Medicine, Animal Resources and Biosecurity, COVAB, and the University of Zurich, supported uh, by the Swiss National Science Foundation, have launched a four-year project to eliminate rabies in Uganda by the year 2030. The World Health Organization report shows that at least 59,000 people succumb to rabies every year. Makedere University College of Veterinary Medicine, Animal Resources and Biosecurity, together with the University of Zurich, have now scaled up a four-year project aimed at eliminating rabies in Uganda. We want to target rabies surveillance in a One Health approach, so that means we want to link the, the cases in dogs with the human bites, so it is important, as I said before, to know when a dog is bites a person, whether or not it is rabbit. Um, this is one goal. The other goal is to more understand the people's perception for dogs also, for dog management, for get them vaccinated and their knowledge about rabies. According to experts, the disease is fatal if a patient is not given immediate attention. However, vaccination is recommended for both humans and dogs. The signs and symptoms of rabies include difficulty in swallowing, paralysis, which leads to coma and death. Difficulties to swallow, um, it paralyzes of the entire body, finally coma and then the death. Certainly, it is very important to get this vaccine. So there is nothing around this. So even if you are in a region where you have poor access to this vaccine, it would still be very important to get that. The Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic Office, who represented the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Umal Kakumba, stressed the significance of this awareness in Africa. We are talking about 59,000 human beings buried every year because of rabies. I think this is a very, very dangerous thing. So I didn't know about that. But as you know, and uh, to make matters worse, we are also informed that 99% of these 59,000 deaths are in Africa and Asia. Now, that makes it very, very dangerous. 
Dr. Kakumba Huntington, a veterinarian from KCCA, says KCCA has intensified vaccination programs in most of its health facilities as one way of controlling the spread of rabies. We are currently doing all these partnerships and efforts, community sensitization. We are doing rabies vaccination camps. We are partnering with whoever can, whoever can bring every resource to control rabies in different ways. One, vaccinate unvaccinated dogs and cats, uh, but especially dogs are usually the biggest issue. So one of the key issues to, to help uh, prevent and control rabies is uh, sensitizing the people, especially communities that are living with dogs, because dogs are the primary source of human rabies. Uh, I think you are aware that uh, over 99% of rabies cases is through dog bites. So we are going to do sensitizing the communities that we are working with. The project will be carried out in Kampala, Chegegwa and Soroti districts, Sudat, Kaye and Maria Namkose. UBC News. The business news is up next after this commercial break. Transport to the wrong person. Here's how to reverse it with MTN Mobile Money. Dial star 165 hash. Select My Account. Select Initiate Reversal. You will see your last three transactions. Select the transaction you want to reverse. Enter your Mobile Money PIN and you'll get an SMS confirmation that the transaction has been blocked from being withdrawn. And that's it. Please note, only transactions that haven't been withdrawn can be reversed. The organizing committee of North Chigezi Diocese is delighted to inform the public of the consecration and enthronement service of Reverend Onesimus Asimwe as the 6th Bishop of North Chigezi Diocese on Sunday, 12th of March, 2023 at Emmanuel Cathedral, Chinyasano, Rukunjiri at 9 a.m. The chief guest is His Excellency General Yori Kaguta Museveni, the President of the Republic of Uganda. RSVP Honorable Major General Jim Muhwezi, Minister of Security and Chairperson Consecration and Enthronement. Are you tired of high fees and slow transfer time when sending money? Look no further. Airtel Money is here to revolutionize the way you move your money. We have revised our rates and now sending money from Airtel to other networks in Uganda, East Africa and to the rest of the world has never been more affordable. Plus, you can trust Airtel Money to get your money where it needs to go quickly and safely. Simply dial star 185 hash and start sending money. Switch to Airtel Money today and experience unbeatable rates and top-notch services for all your local and international money transfer needs. Airtel Money, instant, secure, borderless. Welcome back. Let's have a look now at the latest in business. A government's exponential domestic borrowing is the major contributing factor to the high interest rates from private commercial banks and financial institutions, a global fiscal consultant, uh, Professor Augustus Nwagawa, has uh, disclosed. In his submission, domestic borrowing means competition between private sector and the central bank. However, he has urged the government to strengthen financial in-depth uh, through investment clubs, boosting savings culture and circles formation, among others, that will lessen interest rates. The interest rate in Uganda averaged 11.37% from 2011 to 2023, reaching an all-time high of 23% in November 2021. It means commercial banks continue to raise lending rates to over 18 percent. According to a global fiscal consultant, Professor Augustus Nwagawa, government continuous borrowing from domestic resources is the major cause to exorbitant interest rates. Money invested in treasury, bills and bonds, let me repeat it loudly, is 100 percent risk-free. This is the most advantage of 
with the side of the person who is, who is, who is lending money to government. The most bad news on government borrowing is, is very technical and I want people to understand it, is that when government borrows through the central bank, selling treasury bills, treasury bonds, it is competing with the people in the business. But now there are people in the businesses, one wants to come and borrow 30, are we together? Another one come, wants to come and borrow 6, another one wants to come and borrow 4. So there are three people who want to borrow 40 million. Now, but in the bank there is one now, one now one, 10 million. Now, if in the bank there is 10 million, and the people who want to want, I don't know, over 30 million, what is the manager going to do? Interest rate will go high. Domestic borrowing means government borrows money from commercial banks to finance her activities including health, road construction, paying wages among others due to budget deficit. Meaning the money which the government collects, either through taxes, own and tax, revenue, sources, add it up, it's still less than the money which government spends in salaries, in buying medicines and so on. So what happens is my brother? Government has to borrow, and it can borrow in two ways, either from us Ugandans, what you call domestic borrowing, or from foreign sources. During an exclusive interview to lessen high interest rates, Professor Nwagaba asked the central bank to increase financial in-depth, including formation of circles, investment clubs to enable borrowers access finances in their groups. So government is in need of revenue. People don't want to pay that revenue through taxes. So what we are saying, there must be many ways in which people can borrow, not in the the banks. And this is important. Even if government was not borrowing, still they use sufficient money in, in commercial banks. That's why we need sufficient money. There is money everywhere. There is money in the circles. There is money in investment clubs. There is money in all our, our, our activities. We have uh, savings. Relatedly, Professor Nwagab advised government to abolish the move of multiple agencies to regulate circles, as opposed to using a single regulator which is cost-effective. Robert Boita compiled this report. And of course, uh, tomorrow, Uganda joins the rest of the world to commemorate International uh, Women's uh, Day. And uh, today we're going to look at uh, Dr. Adiri Juliana Omala, an entrepreneur owning Delight Uganda Limited. She's appealing to women uh, to move towards self-empowerment for all inclusive growth. Take a watch. You call upon the women, those who are there, the vice president, the prime minister, the speaker, can't we come together as women and we solve our problems as women and we support each other, especially the undeserved woman at the grassroots. The women entrepreneurs represent the spectrum of micro to macro economic growth in line with supporting professional women farmers, visionaries, among others all playing a critical role in society. Julian Adjeri Omala who was the first woman to win the first woman entrepreneur of the year 2014, awarded by Commonwealth Women, encourages women to believe in themselves while starting up small businesses. It's not about capital. It's about a woman believing in herself and knowing that, yes, I can. It's about the brain, it's about the hands, it's about doing, and it's about being there for each other, working together as women. The way you have planned, you said, okay, let me also go and interview a fellow woman. I said, thank you, and it, Women, we are supposed to be there for each other to believe in ourselves, to start small and continue reinvesting our money in our business. So what can I tell a woman? To me, I believe every woman can. Julian also deals in successful fruit farming in Noya district and employs women in the community as outgrowers. Build a farm institute to train the women at the grassroots so that also they can learn. If they miss to get a certificate, yes. They can come and learn and they get a certificate and they learn how to do it. And we, they are, 
busy in production. They are no longer poor. We are no longer poor because we are together. We are into Noya Fruit Growers Cooperative Society. 70% are women. She appreciated the United Nations women for supporting and empowering other women in Noya District. To you and women for all the support. We've worked together with Noya District, supported 3,000 women and we supported 1,000 women, both refugees and um, refugees and hosting community, working together. If you, are, you get a wife of the landlord, you ask the landlord, the landlord gives us the land user right, then the woman brings the friend who is a refugee, and me as a social centre for now, we work, we plant, and we are in massive production, and we are happy as women. Following this year's International Women's Day theme, Equal opportunities in education, science, technology for innovation, and a gender equal future. A dairy calls on women. Sports news now and uh, Sukuma Foundation Uganda has organized a wellness expo UG 2023 that aims at, uh, at arming Ugandans with skills to avoid non-communicable diseases that statistics show contribute about 39% of all deaths. This expo will coincide with Women's Day celebrations and will be at the KCCA grounds in Lugogo. individuals, companies and organizations that deal with the nine pillars of wellness and also bring together participants from all walks of life to come and experience the information, get resources on wellness. And what we'll do is we're going to ensure that this platform happens as an, an annual event because we think that it is time for Ugandans to focus on their health and on their wellness. It's a very beautiful flat platform by Sukuma Foundation just to make sure we empower your mind, nourish your body and transform your life. At a Boxing as we conclude uh, this uh, sports segment. It's on rare occasions uh, finding a lady take on boxing as a sport. Uh, surprisingly, the young group of uh, elite are joining this particular uh, contact uh, sport. As the world uh, celebrates the International Women's Day, we bring you what it takes for a female boxer to flourish in Uganda. Is Najem, ladies and gentlemen, the winner is Najem Banadia. Stories of female boxers are rare given the nature of training that it takes for one to make it to stardom. Despite the dear situation of slums where most of the young ones come from, with passion for sports, the future of female boxing in Uganda is bright. Uganda Boxing Federation is hosting the National Boxing Open Championship where ladies are equally competing. And how befitting it is coinciding with the International Women's Day mainly when ladies are given the opportunity to box. As a lady, I choose to do boxing um, with a lot of reasons. Um, one of the reasons is that people think ladies and women are weak in doing other hard, hard things. They normally believe boxing is hard. But they, since boxing is easy, as everyone knows, boxing being easy. For example, you fight you with your weightmate, you fight with your somebody of your age category, somebody of your sex. No wonder to many it is a dream come true, while others believe they will surely make it at the world stage. <laughs> Seeing many behind the ropes gives a glimpse at what has defined these women's paths and what drives them to 
to live a legacy. To some, the path has been hard than most. They say that the challenges including gender discrimination, limited training facilities, non-acceptance by the community, and little support by the government to female boxers. Despite the setback and their situation, female boxers still have a big dreams of representing Uganda at future major international events. <laughs> As the world marks the International Women's Day, records of modern female boxing date back to the early 18th century in London, and in the 1904 Olympics, an exhibition bout between women was held. Yet, it was not until the 2012 Olympics, more than a hundred years later, that women's boxing was officially added to the Games. Ngabo Amon. Reporting for ABC TV. And that uh, sports story brings us to the end of this second and final edition of News Tonight here on uh, UBC TV this Tuesday, the 7th day of March 2023. Thank you so much for having kept us company. My name is Rukidi Edward Kijanangoma. Wishing you a blessed night. Inspiring Uganda.